a Wikivide Documentaries production. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. Angio Strongulus Cantunensis. Text box, image Angio Strongulus Cantunensis.png, image underscore caption adult female worm of Angio Strongulus Cantunensis, with characteristic barbapole appearance. Scale bar is 1 mm. Regnum animalia, phylum nematoda, classus cicernatia, ordo strongulida, familia, metastrongulidae, genus Angio Strongulus, species A. Cantunensis, binomial Angio Strongulus Cantunensis, binomial underscore authority, Angio Strongulus Cantunensis is a parasitic nematode that causes Angio Strongyliasis. The most common cause of eosinophilic meningitis in Southeast Asia and the Pacific Basin, the nematode commonly resides in the pulmonary arteries of rats, giving it the common name rat lungworm. Snails are the primary intermediate hosts, where larvae develop until they are infective. Humans are incidental hosts of this roundworm, and may become infected through ingestion of larvae in raw or undercooked snails or other vectors, or from contaminated water and vegetables. The larvae are then transported via the blood to the central nervous system, where they are the most common cause of eosinophilic meningitis, a serious condition that can lead to death or permanent brain and nerve damage. Angiostrongyliasis is an infection of increasing public health importance as globalization contributes to the geographic spread of the disease. History First described by Chen in Cantonese rats, the nematode Angiostrongulus cantunensis was identified in the cerebrospinal fluid of a patient with eosinophilic meningitis by Nomura and Lim in Taiwan in 1944. They noted that raw food eaten by the patient may have been contaminated by rats. In 1955, Macross and Sanders identified the life cycle of the worm in rats, defining snails and slugs as the intermediate hosts, and noting the path of transmission through the blood, brain, and lungs in rats. Infectious Agent A. contunensis is a helminth of the phylum Nematoda, order Strongyolida, and superfamily Metastrongloidea. Nematodes around worms characterized by a tough outer cuticle, unsegmented bodies, and a fully developed gastrointestinal tract. The order Strongyolida includes hookworms and lungworms. Metastrongloidea are characterized as 2 cm long, slender, thread-like worms that reside in the lungs of the definitive host. Angiostrongulus costarosensis is a closely related worm that causes intestinal angiostrongyliasis in Central and South America. Epidemiology and Pathogenesis Following World War II, A. contunensis spread throughout Southeast Asia and Western Pacific Islands, including Australia, Melanesia, Micronesia, and Polynesia. Cases were soon reported in New Caledonia, the Philippines, Rarotonga, Saipan, Sumatra, Taiwan, and Tahiti. In the 1960s, even more cases were reported from the region from locations such as Cambodia Guam, Hawaii, Java, Thailand, Sarawak, Vietnam, and the New Hebrides. In 1961, an epidemiological study of the eosinophilic meningitis in humans was conducted by Rosen, Legrette, and Boris, who hypothesized that the parasite causing these infections was carried by fish. However, Alicata noted that raw fish was consumed by large numbers of people in Hawaii without apparent consequences, and patients presenting with meningitis symptoms had a history of eating raw snails or prawns in the weeks before presenting with symptoms. This observation, along with epidemiology and autopsy of infected brains, confirmed a cantunensis infection in humans as the cause of the majority of eosinophilic meningitis cases in Southeast Asia and the Pacific Islands. Since then, cases of A. contunensis infestations have appeared in American Samoa, Australia, Hong Kong, Bombay, Fiji Hawaii, Honshu, India, Kyushu, New Britain, Okinawa, Ryukyu Islands, Western Samoa, and most recently mainland China. Other sporadic occurrences of the parasite in its rat hosts have been reported in Cuba, Egypt, Louisiana, Madagascar, Nigeria, New Orleans, and Puerto Rico. In 2013, A. contunensis was confirmed present in Florida, USA, where its range and prevalence are expanding. In recent years, the parasite has been shown to be proliferating at an alarming rate due to modern food consumption trends and global transportation of food products.
Scientists are calling for a more thorough study of the epidemiology of acantunensis, stricter food safety policies, and the increase of knowledge on how to properly consume products commonly infested by the parasites such as snails and slugs that act as intermediate hosts or those that act as paratenic hosts such as fish, frogs, or freshwater prawns. Food items that can be contaminated by the mucus excretions of intermediate or paratenic hosts such as snails and slugs or by the feces of rats that act as definitive hosts can lead to infection of acantunensis. The most common route of infection of acantunensis in humans is by ingestion of either intermediate or paratenic hosts of the larvae. Unwashed fruits and vegetables especially romaine lettuce can be contaminated with snail and slug mucus or can result in accidental ingestion of these intermediate and paratenic hosts. These items need to be properly washed and handled to prevent accidental ingestion of acantunensis larvae itself or the larvae containing hosts. The best mechanism of prevention of acantunensis outbreak is to institute an aggressive control of snail and slug population, proper cooking of intermediate and paratenic hosts such as fish, freshwater prawn, frogs, mollusks and snails along with proper food handling techniques. The common prevention techniques for diarrheal illness is very effective in preventing a cantunensis infection. Not much is known about why it targets the brain in humans, but a chemical-induced chemotaxis has been implicated recently. Acetylcholine has been previously reported to enhance motility of this worm via nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Experimental assays in animal model are needed to validate a chemical-induced chemotaxis by use of anticholinergic drugs to prevent cerebral infection following infections by acantonesis. Hosts Intermediate hosts of larvae for acantunensis include, definitive host of angiostrongylus cantunensis include wild rodents, especially the brown rat and the black rat. Paratenic hosts of angiostrongylus cantunensis include, predatory land flatworm platydemus manaquari, and amphibians Bufo asiaticus, Rana catispiana, Rocophorus leucomistax and Rana luminocaris. In 2004, a captive yellow-tailed black cockatoo, and two free-living tawny frogmouths suffering neurological symptoms were shown to have the parasite. They were the first avian hosts discovered. For the organism, pathogenesis of human angiostrongylosis. The presence of parasitic worms burrowed in the neural tissue of the human CNS will cause obvious complications. All of the following will result in damage to the CNS. Eosinophilic meningitis. See also vertical bar eosinophilic meningitis. Although the clinical disease caused by angiostrongylus invasion into the central nervous system is commonly referred to as eosinophilic meningitis, the actual pathophysiology is of a meningoencephalitis with invasion not just of the meninges or superficial lining of the brain, but also deeper brain tissue. Initial invasion through the lining of the brain. The meninges may cause a typical inflammation of the meninges and a classic meningitis picture of headache, stiff neck and often fever. The parasites subsequently invade deeper into the brain tissue, causing specific localizing neurologic symptoms depending on where in the brain parenchyma they migrate. Neurologic findings and symptoms wax and wane as initial damage is done by the physical in-migration of the worms and secondary damage is done by the inflammatory response to the presence of dead and dying worms. This inflammation can lead in the short term to paralysis, bladder dysfunction, visual disturbance and coma, and in the long term to permanent nerve damage, mental retardation, nerve damage, permanent brain damage or death. Eosinophilic meningitis is commonly defined by the increased number of eosinophils in the cerebrospinal fluid. In most cases, Eosinophil levels rise to 10 or more eosinophils per microliter in the cerebrospinal fluid, accounting for at least 10% of the total CSF leukocyte count. The chemical analysis of the CSF typically resembles the findings in aseptic meningitis, with slightly elevated protein levels, normal glucose levels and negative bacterial cultures. Presence of a significantly decreased glucose on CSF analysis is an indicator of severe meningoencephalitis and may indicate a poor medical outcome. Initial CSF analysis early in the disease process may occasionally show no increase of eosinophils only. 
to have classical increases in eosinophils and subsequent spinal fluid analysis. Caution should be advised in using eosinophilic meningitis as the only criterion for diagnosing angiostrongylus infestation in someone. With classic symptoms as the disease evolves with the migration of the worms into the central nervous system, eosinophils are specialized white blood cells of the granulocytic cell line which contain granules in their cytoplasm. These granules contain proteins that are toxic to parasites. When these granules degranulate, or break down, chemicals are released that combat parasites such as acantunensis. Eosinophils, which are located throughout the body, are guided to sites of inflammation by chemokines when the body is infested with parasites such as acantunensis. Once at the site of inflammation, type 2 cytokines are released from helper T cells which communicate with the eosinophils, signaling them to activate. Once activated, eosinophils can begin the process of degranulation, releasing their toxic proteins in the fight against the foreign parasite. Clinical Signs and Symptoms According to a group case study, the most common symptoms in mild eosinophilic meningitis tend to be headache, photophobia or visual disturbance, neck stiffness, fatigue, hyperesthesias, vomiting and paresthesias. Incubation period is often three weeks, but can be 336 days and even 80 days. Possible clinical signs and symptoms of mild and severe eosinophilic meningitis are as follows. Treatment the severity and clinical course of angiostrongylus disease depends significantly on the ingested load of third-stage larvae, creating great variability from case to case making clinical trials difficult to design and effectiveness of treatments difficult to discern. Typical conservative medical management including analgesics and sedatives provide minimal relief for the headaches and hyperesthesias. Removing cerebrospinal fluid at regular 3-7 to seven day intervals is the only proven method of significantly reducing intracranial pressure, and can be used for symptomatic treatment of headaches. This process may be repeated until improvement is shown. There is growing evidence of moderate quality that suggests corticosteroid therapy using prednis alone or dexamethasone has beneficial effect in treating the CNS symptoms related to acantunasis infections. Although early research did not show treatment with anti-helminthic agents like thiobendazole or albendazole effective in improving the clinical course of the illness. A number of recent studies out of Thailand and China show that the combination of glucocorticoids and antihelminthics are safe and decrease the duration of headaches and the number of patients who had significant headache. Although the addition of antihelminthic agents for management of a cantunensis infection has a theoretic risk of precipitating a neurologic crisis by releasing an overwhelming load of antigens though simultaneous death of the larvae. No study has shown this to exist in the clinical setting. Additionally, the failure to kill parasites before they attempt to migrate out of the CNS increases the risk of mechanical damage by migrating larvae. Although combination therapy using albendazole and prednis alone has no significant advantage compared to treatment using prednis alone alone in mild cases, the treatment with anti-helminthics is demonstrably safe and may have significant benefit for patients with high parasite loads at risk for permanent disability or death. Further studies to better define treatment regimens for mild, moderate, and severe disease would be extremely useful, but have not yet been performed due to the technical difficulties mentioned above. Brought to you by Wikivideo Documentaries. Would you like to know more?